Okay, so uh, thank you everybody and welcome to this first panel for uh, techniques and innovations. Uh, we've got three panelists. Uh, we'll do all three panelists and then we'll do questions at the end. Although uh, with this, I'm sure that everybody in this room will probably have their own perspective on things. So we can kind of make it questions and observations uh, looking at the things that the panellists have talked about from our own perspectives, how we might take things forwards as well. So rather than just making it kind of a straight question and answer session, try and make it more of a conversation. Um, so, uh, first panellist is uh, in my worst Portuguese accent, Pian uh, Oliveira uh, Rezende. Uh, who will be uh, delivering a talk about uh, his innovation, uh, these wonder cards. So um, I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. Good morning, um, it's a pleasure to be here, I'm very happy. My name is Hia Rezende, I'm a professor at the Typical Catholic University, in the Rio de Arts and Design Department, and I hope that you enjoy Wonder cards, storytelling, imagination, storytelling, and role playing in the creation of objects, space, and experience. First, a quote from Mary Shelley, Everything must have a beginning, and that beginning must be needed something that breaks the form. Invasion must be humbly admitted. Does not consist in creating out, okay, nice, out of void, but out of chaos. The materials must, in the first place, be a form. It can give form to darkness, shapeless substances, but cannot bring it being the substance itself. Invasion consists in the capacity of seizing on the capabilities of the subject and the power of molding and fashioning ideas. So, with this in mind, we started thinking about our tool and that's the introduction of the real and questions and the wonder cards. This book explores the story then and holding plane as a resource to create objects, space, and experience in the field of design. It's based on Romantic poets of Vienna and their ideas about imagination, art, and science. The cruise and smelting, the art co concepts about decent analysis and creativity, Holland Bach's theories on fantasy and projects, and Raphael's Vienna's concepts on role and play. And the guiding question was the reflections present arose from the initial reflection about how our knowledge defines and limits us creativity. It's assumed that when we are confronted with a problem or creatively demanded, we walk these questions with our repertoire and thus we limit, limit innovation capacity. These restrictions occur because we apply existing solutions, adding only small advances. The questions that guide the study, inspired by the work of Ellen and Nolan, are how we can go beyond creative limitations caused by our conceptual limits based on existing knowledge. How do we bring together reason and fantasy to pursue ways initially unimaginable? How do we use narrative and role and playing to expand these features? To explore this connection, we create the World of Cards, a brainstorm card game focused on the development of ideas, objects, surrounds, stories, and experience that simulate sense and imagination. We are testing the game, this game on Pontifical Catholic University and also in workshops. So let's go. Theory, yeah. reason, poetry, science, and imagination. Uh, there's a book from Frederick Schlegel, The Dialects of Fragments. By the end of 19th century, Vienna, Germany, a group of poets, philosophers, and scientists exchanged ideas and experience. Our art should become science, and now science art. Poetry and philosophy should be made one. Lego. They aim to end the existing separation between reason and imagination. Truth, 
releasing creative potentials, but this would not happen freely. A method was necessary. So, another theory was the science as structured imagination. As authors state, knowledge and expectation of how things are, that is, the visions and the interpretations that individuals make the world, influence the way of thinking and creating. Existing conceptual space constrain creativity to an important extent. Decent analogy may have been a crucial importance to move away from well trodden paths. Decent analogies avoid imaginative cliches, for they bring together different elements, and those are the kind of analogies we explore through the water cards. So, better, more theory. For Baptist, the method ends up leading only to a stagnant path. The fetish allows, allows to go beyond this. A fetish, where at least something that causes way, a round of desires, of image that circles, that search through for us, sometimes for a lifetime, and frequently only crystallize through a word. The word, the biggest significance, induced from fetish to exploration. It's exploration through different bits of knowing, the research. Fantasy explore itself just like an open gas mine. Um, at last, Rafael Piano's definitions of role and playing. Role and playing is a pretending a character living in a shared story world as an agent and requires all actors at a game session to collaborate. Role and playing works because of narrative and logic elements, or so it seems. We try to expand the imagination process using the wonder cards and to allow the creation of objects, space, and experience through the players using narrative as a support. But how do we foster imagination and desire? How does the wonder encourage and creatively and bring closer reason and imagination? Bearing that in mind, we wrote in the article, Wonder Design and the Exploration of Sense and Imagination where we present the initial concepts and the inspirations of what we call wonder design. We try to stimulate the creation of concepts and projects that spur imagination, creativity, and the sense of wonder. By wonder, we mean enchantment, amazement, that is, elements which awaken sense, emotions, and curiosities in the individual. Our idea was to remove certain rational knots in the process of design and to allow a greater freedom of creation. So, let's see finally the water cards. Here are the water cards. Um, more water cards, the Portuguese edition, but he is in English. Uh, here, concepts. The water cards are an imagination instrument and a tool that helps in the development of living objects. In the basic set, there is like five types of cards. So, imagination, objects, Emotions, sense, and space. Um, there are three imagination cards which are inspired by two romantic poets. The categorizing of imagination performed by Samuel Taylor College, associated with William Wood, both ideas on emotion and intellectual fantasy. Sense, they are inspired on comments and suggestions from Johannes Palasma about Rudolf Stein. Stein was a philosopher, a mystic, and an educator. It defines 12 sense cards. So here's some examples. Don't like the Libram movement. Emotion, objects, and place, inspired by Professor Stewart Kane's card game on the Academy University. For the reason that it would be impossible to cover all possibilities, in this free category, there is also a free choice card. So here, the player can suggest the free and emotion, place, and objects. Let's see uh, an example here. This guy pick up five cards and was emotion, no, imagination, emotion, object, book, sense, space, emotion, and place of. He also said emotional to shy to book, book to cook book, taste sweet to book page, subject to great mother silence, and earth to hope trip. And this group of cards leads to imagine an eatable book inspired by great master cybers and shy loop memories that would travel by trailer to different places. Yes, and then just read it, he could eat the pages of tasting memorable in cybers. Um, 
And after the basic set, we create the start L expansion. So here is the start L expansion. From the basic structures and categories of one graphs, we develop other models aimed to explore narrative elements and the role in playing aging in the process of creating stories, objects, space, and experience. So was new. The category gen explores narrative genres. There are seven double cards. Double cards are this card, right? So, okay. Um, the characters, one is composed of 14 double cards, tied into 28 characters. The series aims to simulate a path among the players with different personalities and to use this feeling to create stories. The first category image simulates players to connect events of to the characters. All according to the narrative environment suggested by the genre cards, there are nine double cards. Right? So here, we create the mods for the expansion, genre cards, and habits. In these three categories, there is also a free choice. So one, two, and also a free choice. And combining these three categories and using cards from other wonder cards categories, the players must incorporate such concepts and create a playful narrative structure. To assist them, we develop a card support material and sheet of imagination. Each sheet of paper presents a different playing mode. There are modes focused on the creation of backgrounds, objects, space, and also stories. Here are some students using just the paper, right, and the cards. And for example, using this, and more students <laughs> using this. And um, let's see one example. Example one, hold and play modes. They've got like nine cards, right? And it was fantasy, garden, affection, candy, murder, and characters. Mermaid, pirate, queen, and fairy. Okay. And mixing this together, with this card, they create a narrative situation. In a universe where the world is a huge garden of sweets, a murder took place, which prompted fear through the kingdoms. The king was dead. To investigate the crime, the queen summoned the representatives of the kingdoms. The mermaid from the shop of the lake, the licorice parts, and the jelly beans fairy. And in the, this narrative game, the space full of sweets. Each player takes a hole, and while they save the treats, the only play happens until so they come to find out who is the killer and how everything and uh, here another example. Then we pick up Sura, Rome, Nostalgia, Protestant, Shiloh, Man, Living Object. In here, they choose a psychologist. And with these elements, they create this story. With this card, they create a live action, some kind of small art. A man confined to a room when he talks to a mirror, which reflects him when he was a child. Meanwhile, a psychologist finds out what has been haunting him for all these years. The group created the space of the room and decided it would be necessary that someone play the role of Mew and they create the story and details of this object. And the other players would play the man, the child, the psychologist. In the interpretations and conversation between the characters, they find out what haunts the man. So, this, in, in like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we develop ways to use the cards, but the participants also can create their own ways to play. Some ways, the cards are actually secret and handle. It's the most common that we use. Roll and play, participants take out the cards, create a story, and hold and play the characters as they experience the story. If the player already has in mind the kind of object, experience, and story, or space, intends to create, he puts the selected card on the table and takes out handle cards from Different, different types of cards. <coughs> the one of the cards is, and it's story style expression, explore the connection between reason and imagination. They open possibilities that go beyond those, li those limited by reason. By introducing the principles of role and play and narrative, we allow players to explore the creation of stories as a narrative force. They create settings, objects, backgrounds, games, and a narrative experience which emerges from the connection between their sense, emotions, memories, and difference. Mix it with random elements deriving from the wonder cards, being challenged by the fantastic and the wonderful. On such occasion where the master repertoire is not enough and a new perspective is essential, creative leaps are stimulated and wonder happens. 
have a video. It's it's the video uh, is only for the basic set. It is more video, but you, you, it's good that you can see how play the parts, right?
so perhaps I am I am entering the, back into the classroom teaching fifth grade in Austin next year. So perhaps this could become more of an academic study when I have some subjects in front of me. Um, so while I was uh, underemployed and doing a lot of reading uh, in the late summer and early fall, I was looking for a publisher that could possibly help me publish these almost 40 edularps I've created for elementary school and came across uh, old biographies and books about and by Dorothy Hefka, who is a, a educator and education professor in England starting in the 60s and she was trained as an actress wanting to become famous but that didn't happen and she ended up using what she learned about drama um, to teach children and to teach educators to use drama uh, in their teaching. Um, so she created a teacher and role, a dramatic tool uh, that lots of teachers use. Uh, Mantle of the Expert, which I'll explain, and um, what she calls process drama. So kids are in this story, um, and the learning happens uh, during this process of creating the drama together. So I hit in a founder of the Danish LARP school to represent Edge LARP, but it could have been many people here, um, against Dorothy uh, in this battle. Um, that happened in my mind while I did all of this reading over the past 10 months. Uh, so by Edu LARP, uh, when I teach teachers how to use LARP for their uh, educational purposes and when I create my own LARPs for the classroom, I start with my learning objective and then just brainstorm a story or world, a conflict that can happen, characters, whether I create them, they're co-created with my students, or if I'm giving students free reign to create their own characters in this world. Uh, I'll use some game mechanics, rules, and meta techniques, and when I'm creating these edularps, if I have something very specific in terms of content I'd like to teach, I'll put heavier, use heavier game mechanics and rules. Or if I have a rambunctious group of children, I really pack in the rules so, uh, they're limited in what they can do while they're improvising. Um, sometimes we have prop, props and costumes. Of course, they need to improvise, and I make sure our teachers know that we need to workshop in the beginning, whether that's about characters, the story, the educational content, so they're prepared to play and then debrief the experience, or else there is no educational value. As I did my reading in Mant about Mantle of the Expert, I saw that. Uh, the route to creating the drama in this technique started with a theme, then what they call an the overview of learning, um, brainstorming interesting aspects of that, some inquiry questions that are gonna guide the process drama, then create this narrative, the story. In the mantle of the expert, the teacher creates this world and this narrative, and the children are always uh, the experts. So there is video of Dorothy Hesketh um, showing off this technique where she is uh, the boss of a boot factory and all of the kids are expert boot makers. Uh, and they, all, they have a client they're working for, I think their customers, I can't remember, and then there's a commission, something they have to do. Um, so it makes it very focused uh, and maybe sometimes limited, but even if the kids know nothing about the subject, just pitting them as the experts can engage them into the learning. They also consider other points of view in the story, um, list out a list of tasks that they'll go through in this process drama over the course of the days. Of course, look at to the curriculum, why are you doing this in school? resources you need and then list out all of the steps that will happen and some of the scripts even have dialogue that the teacher enrolled. Like Dorothy is sometime, was sometimes playing the boss of the factory, sometimes playing a customer. She's going in and out of herself as the teacher and then into many different roles. Uh, when I 
teach teachers how to use educational LARP and tell them it's not a scary thing, you can do it, and don't teach anything that you already do. Uh, I show them that your workshop is really just your teaching content, maybe you gotta practice some improv and learn your characters, or maybe you're reviewing content to get ready for the story. Your LARP might be a hook into a new topic. Uh, you're learning about Civil War, you know nothing about it, you can have a little LARP that uh, engages kids, but they don't need to know any content yet. Maybe you're at the end of a unit of study and you're at the culminating celebration, kids know they're working up um, to this role play. Maybe you're using it as an uh, assessment of what are they doing in character, and you're having a checklist to see what the kids can actually do. You could problem solve, create a shared experience. Sometimes I use LARP in the classroom as a collective text. Uh, maybe we'll read a novel together, but we can also be in the novel um, and refer back to that in our uh, And then at the end, you want to debrief. That could be where you assess as well and reflect, analyze what happened in the story, make connections to other content, or um, reteach something you noticed in the role play that they didn't quite understand. So I tell teachers, keep doing what you're doing and see where you can insert a LARPing experience. In my studying of uh, Mantle of the Expert, I saw this planning she and it seems more um, uh, linear to me. Uh, like before, you just plan these steps out and then you march through them. Uh, and one more visual example of this is here is a LARP about Westward expansion, where I read the kids an introduction about 1789, the United States is a young nation, blah, blah, blah. Um, travel back to and speed through the 1800s to experience the fight for land and the territories that would become the United States of America. So in starting this, I don't really know what's going to happen. I gave them all these characters that actually existed and participated or fought against westward expansion. Um, and we'll see what happens. In the mantle of the expert team, it seems like you, you kind of know where you're leading kids. Um, and again, it seems much more uh, linear in what happens. So I'm going to compare Edulark and mantle of the expert and based on these three criteria. Which one engage students better? Which model is better for actual academic learning and assessment of that learning, since that's the thing that American schools really care about these days? Um, and which one is better in terms of teacher preparation? Um, like, can teachers actually learn it fast and do it well? Uh, so, for student engagement, I wanted to have subtopics of the age and development level, um, student participation, and then which one is creating community better. In terms of age, this isn't scientific at all, but in my observations, uh, I've, in my reading, I think Mantle of the Expert works really well with um, pre-K and primary age students uh, because it's more guided uh, and there are less rules. Um, but as kids get older, I can see that it's more developmentally appropriate for uh, them to use visual art. Um, and there are lots of entry entry points into participation in the mantle of the expert. I mean, in visual art, uh, in terms of participation, many different characters. It's easy for me to differentiate uh, instruction and tasks for kids to do. And with EduLearn and Mantle of the Expert, all of the kids are the experts together, and they're all doing the same uh, tasks at the same time. However, I can see in building community, uh, Mantle of the Expert, um, kids are really, they don't start doing any tasks until the teacher has um, brought the kids emotionally into the story to care about the topic um, and the problem that they're solving for. Uh, here's a picture of my fifth graders last year in a lark called The Union of Wolves, which was a, a metaphorical take on the problems that the North and South faced leading up to the Civil War. So they had different dens of wolves that came at their problem in their uh, forest community from different perspectives. Uh, so, I can see here that uh, there were many things that they were doing, they have props, they're being active, 
Um, if I did the same kind of content with Mantle of the expert, knowing the kids in that class, I'm not sure that I would have had a total involvement. Here is a Mantle of the expert example of kids who read the story about bears, and the bears were um, held captive uh, in a circus or something as dancing bears, and kids thought that that was just unjust and that they were going to do something about it, break those bears free. Uh, so all of the play happens in their mind, and if the teacher can get kids to really care about that topic, uh, then that could clearly work. So I think that uh, Mantle of the Expert wins with building community here, according to me, but I think overall, EduLarp is the winner of student engagement. For learning and assessment, I have these main categories. Um, I've acted in a close focus, teaching SEL skills, maximizing instructional time, making learning visible, and then having an integrated curriculum, and then that ability to assess. Um, you're able to focus on academic content and with both techniques. Uh, I think it just depends on your, your planning. Um, teaching and learning social-emotional learning skills. Uh, I can see since emotion drives mental of the expert work, I think that it lends itself better that SEO work. Uh, and maximizing instructional time, if you do a mantle of the expert uh, plan, you need many, many days to move through that process drama. So since you're supposed to jam in a ton of learning in every minute, uh, and it's uh, teaching and learning in schools these days, it's easier, I think, to do that with an EduLARP to just design a one-time shot uh, LARP to maximize that instructional time. Uh, here is a pre and post test for a LARP about teaching direct versus representative democracy and kids play at works that battled out in the field outside of the school. Um, and before we played works living under different kinds of democracy battling, I gave kids a pre test to see if they understood anything about the Federalist and Anti Federalist uh, influence on types of democracy. And then after we LARPed, so I was able to assess, but I think it didn't transfer past uh, that unit of study because it was a one-shot LARP that we didn't continue reflecting on. Uh, we also didn't make our learning visible here. We went and played in the field and had great discussions, but we didn't make anything that um, held up, let kids hold on to that learning. I think Mantle of the Expert, they're making artifacts all along their process drama that are visible and all around them. Um, sometimes we do that with an EduLARP, but it's not always the case. It's more we are in the action. And for, uh, oh, so I think Mantle of the Expert is here. In terms of teacher preparation, I think about this a lot because I'm not just teaching now. I'm working as an education consultant and uh, coach with school districts and school teams doing school redesign. And they're brain dreaming up these big ideas for deeper learning. But then they need to remember that they have to teach their, train their staff to do all of the things they want to implement. So in terms of required professional development, I think since uh, there are a few different categories of creating a LARP and you can just brainstorm for each of them, it's easier for teachers to learn how to do that. Even me reading a ton about mental of the expert, I feel unprepared to try one out um, because of all of the pieces involved in creating Antelope, the expert plan. This is somebody's plan. Uh, when I teach teachers, I just tell them have a have your educational objective in mind. Maybe you want to have it be a hook into your new content. Practice what you're already doing here. Use it as a performance assessment, um, and then just knock in your characters you're setting, um, your game mechanics. Uh, so the lesson planning load seems really big uh, in terms of preparing for a process drama or mental of the expert plan. Um, and classroom management, however, I would give points to mental of the expert because uh, we're all doing the same thing at the same time as experts in a collective. So I think that EduLARP is uh, easier for teachers to prepare. In conclusion, I think Edgelove is the winner. Uh, and I recommend this.
missions, I would teach teachers about education law first, um, but include both method, uh, methods in teacher instruction and professional development. And for me, I will study many more resources and articles to be better prepared uh, to use me as a expert. And I will do it there too. <laughs> um, and our last panelist for today uh, is uh, Lucas Farros. Is that right? Yeah. Excellent. Um, I'll try to get to And I want to play a video later. That's is it. this it? Love, Eric. That looks like it. Yes. You know people on Facebook and they do Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Plymouth Plantation. Uh, they don't have actors anymore. It used to be just actors with a few buildings. Uh, there was a development that happened and then there was too much uh, expense in keeping up the grounds versus paying the actors. Because back when my grandmother worked there, and she's on the cover of this 1977 uh, Plymouth Plantation book, like wood was rotting away, the stairs were definitely unsafe. But that's how I met my grandmother, was by an immersive narrative storyteller first. Right? So as a two-year-old, that was my expectation, that was my entry point, which I like to stroke my ego and tell myself is similar to like when Tony Hawk saw his brother skate inside the pool, and two-year-old Tony Hawk just said, well, that's what you did, which was not what you just did. His brothers were revolutionary. <clears throat> um, my mother's a psychologist. She helped develop statistical psychology. If you got those tests when you are in school that said like, do you drink on the weekends? Are you using unprotected sex? You don't develop that stuff. <clears throat> and my father gave me a value for the arts and philosophy, would be the Lord of the Rings. He gave me a value for aesthetics and the power that they have. So that, that's kind of what I'm coming in here with today. Um, I'm a big fan of Carl Jung. I think that it is an underused resource <laughs> in today. And the ideas that Young has given us is like the keys to the castle, the crayons to recreate worlds. Uh, so I was working with Leslie University. It took me 10 years. I have a lot of disabilities. I have every disability on the books, on the books, books. So, <laughs> it's taken me so long to become a friend. Uh, uh, so, you know, that, that's, that was a huge struggle. That was a huge struggle. And on top of that, like, I didn't get glasses until I was in fifth grade, and I had massive stigmatism. So I was one of the wayward children, right, that just couldn't do well in a school prioritized with, I love math, and I love science, but it's typically like math, science, social studies, and then da da da, and then you have like art and music, and then way down here in the bottom, we put trauma and dance. That might be a mistake. It might be a mistake. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing these things. I've been working with kids. I started teaching when I was 13. I'm 40 now. And I've been picked up LARP as a tool in early 2000. I didn't know what I was doing at first. I was teaching uh, at a gig in uh, Western Mass, being this guy called Dr. Wormhole. I would teach science. It was Doc Brown mixed with uh, Johnny Depp from uh, Sleep No More, right? Okay? And I said, wow, this is powerful. Kids actually care about what I'm teaching them. What if I did this in a classroom and I tried to do some kind of weirdo Harry Potter thing? So that became Dr. Wormhole School of Magic and blah, blah, whatever. And I had a lot of weird friends in uh, Western Mass, like with esoteric studies, who were teaching tarot cards, wine making, da, da, da. I still didn't know what I was doing until, lo and behold, a student taught me what LARP was. And I went to my first offer LARP, which was Great Thorn, back in 2000. So that's kind of what brought me into this whole world. And as an educator my whole life, I kind of was like super bored with everything. I was trained to be a fine artist, and I was bored of teaching painting. The kids didn't like it, I didn't like it. Can we do this thing? We do this thing. We do this thing, now it's done. You can very conveyor belt, very isolationist. Right? Because if you have a test, and you, you look at Amanda's answer, that's cheap. But in this world, that's called collaboration. Right? So that something wasn't striking me. I, I didn't like education at all. 
I had a hard time with it. I was in the principal's office a lot. It wasn't until I was a senior where I had a, a, psycho a teacher in psychology who basically said, hey guys, standardized testing is about to fall down the pipe. So you're the last class I get to teach this curriculum to. I can never teach this curriculum again. This guy who made me a D student to an A student because of the curriculum he was teaching couldn't teach it ever again. And new things were happening that just didn't match up, right? Because kids now, you're the classic Toyota camera of 2007. We're pumping them out in little eggshells. They're not working together. It's your age is more important than your actual educational level. So something was like striking me. I didn't, I didn't have an answer, but maybe it's because, you know, we're working with the system that was developed during the enlightenment of industrialization. Maybe because our school system, because before that there was no schools, was made during a time to get people into factories. And it was a radical idea, like we're just gonna educate everyone for free. It was a great idea, but that technology and mindset has become arcane. So here's some people, you know, they're talking about what you can do with art. You know, Armstrong, we're talking about multiple intelligences using different lenses, so we're putting values on things like dance, because it's kinesthetic language. We're talking about multiple literacies, educations. Some people need to dance to think, right? Some people need to draw to think. Some people need to do math to think. Some people need to act to think. And that all these different things actually communicate to different things within our being. You know, so this child, as we all were, with their own geniusness. Okay, so I'm into this book here, Breaking Point and Beyond. It's an old book. It talks about change. And it talks about our era right now in change. And that how change even changes. And how ideas that used to not be good then become critical as a literacy to move forward. You know, it's kind of a side part of Amanda's thing, but like this idea of having critical literacies and what they are, and then the small detail of like, we're teaching up against the construct that puts these expectations on how education should look. How should we raise children for the future? How do we tell them to live their lives in a world where economics is changing every five weeks? Where globalization is happening, but we still need to have some kind of cultural identity. So, you know, the resolutions are this kind of idea of, okay, if I have an immersive, multi-intelligence platform, I'm gonna hit all those levels of education. I'm gonna speak to every child. If I have play, I'm gonna enjoy what I'm doing, I'm gonna learn faster, I'm gonna learn better, my neural netting's gonna link together. I'm gonna create a dream weaver of neural netting, which will then capture more data and success. Right? Those breakthroughs at your job, those breakthroughs you have in your personal life and relationships, they don't come when you're like, I hate my life. They come when you're inspired, you're excited, you're activated. And then the community part, everyone has to have voice, everyone has to have agency. That whole pyramid scheme of education, which look, it was a great idea. Uh, we started making schools, this idea of academics. And then academics made this bridge though, you're educated or you're not, so you're smart or you're not. And that affected economics and resourcing. So it became that we were trained to be in a pyramid scheme and not work with each other, don't look at Amanda's answers and don't ask your questions, be your own individual power. That's not gonna work in a 20th century skill set world. So we have our points for immersive arts, we have our points for learning through play. I actually came about it to know all those points about process trauma through Wilhelm's plans. Um, and it was great to hear it through your eyes. Thank you for that, I really appreciate that. But these ideas of if I play, I'm gonna learn it better and I'm gonna learn it at different levels. And then the agency part, which is like, we gotta give everybody a voice because all learning is social. We're designed as humans to connect with these mirror neurons to learn through interacting with each other. We could learn through interacting with ourselves, right? But if we look at you know, statistics gathered in books like uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People that talk about how, I think it's 89% of engineers are more capable than the other 11% 
But that 11% has social skills and works well with others. And they get all the credit and the success. That's very frustrating if you're introvert, shy, just don't like people because you like animals, or you just like data and you can't express your ideas. That's very frustrating because no one gave you the skill set because you were doing so well at the top of the pyramid of one technology literacy that you just kind of went in that hole. Okay, so my argument here, which I don't think I need to sell you on, is that we're talking about critical literacies that develop 21st century skills. And LARP is a structure, a scaffolding, a platform that just does that. No argument. You know, it's so easy to come in today, right? Because we, we talked about one thing, which was, uh, I wrote down um, conceptual limits that are made through our, our confines of our identity, our self-value, our value with community, and our purpose, and how do we get beyond those and grow, right? And then we came in with edgy LARP and looking at how it is in the classroom, and that, yes, maybe there's some things that are lost, but it's superior platform but it's still up against this, this confine of the enlightenment industrialization, arguably the military industrial complex of education, right? We're creating, and like, by the way, how valuable is a VA these days, right? Because everyone has one now. There's more education, more educators than ever. And so it's like a high school diploma. You're not guaranteed a job. It used to be, <coughs> in the 1950s, you get a diploma and you have a job if you wanted one. I didn't want one. <laughs> but like, because I never had a job. But like, you know, now it's like, you need a master's or a PhD, or forget about it, we're not gonna set you up for life. Kids get this, I've been working with kids for 20 years, they get it, they're frustrated, they're inheriting a dying world, and they're told, even if I play by your rules, I'm not guaranteed anything. So why should I care? So that's it. That's my whole thing. These are all the books that are in this. Uh, I can give you a list of those if you're interested. But I've been working with the uh, middle school youth and teens and adults and families, mostly in the Boston metro area. Of course, that's limited. I'd love to get to Dorchester. Uh, this stuff does take a little bit of funding. Uh, I have worked with Dot Art before, and I have worked with the inner city kids, and I think it will work great. And I found that it works with uh, you know well-off kids as well because they're excited and they're bored and they want to be interacting with. Um, and so the main concept here is that instead of trying to make education LARP fit education models, I know, I'm radical here. I went to Leslie, I'm an artist. I'm 40 and I still look like this. Imagine me at 20, my poor mother, okay. Is that those educational models are outdated in old technology. You're going online with Windows 95. It was decent, I know but it's 2018, it's not gonna work. And I think that's, a, that's basically what I got. This is a rule book that I made to kind of teach this model. So this rule book has values and models in place. It's being rewritten every year. All those people wrote it. Um, and the idea is that the LARP itself, and this is middle school kids love fantasy. I find older kids like apocalypse settings and adults really like things that challenge morality. So the models that I do is I do a fantasy one, I do a dystopian one, and I do a deep space sci-fi one. I'm trying to work with those populations. And so this book is made to put curriculum in it instead of put it in curriculum. The classroom is the community, not the building. Right, that's it. You can contact me there. Put the bench program at gmail.com. Uh, do, do I have any more time? Uh, two minutes. Two minutes? Can I show a video? Yeah. <laughs> Show you something my kids made last year. So you gotta understand, like part of what's making this successful is, is in generational education. You know, I have high schoolers working with middle schoolers, and I'm teaching adults to work with high schoolers. And eventually, I'll just phase myself out, and no one will need me. It'll be awesome. I totally didn't even have it. Oh, I don't have it. I have my apologies. Okay. <laughs> yeah, basically what I'm showing you guys is my thesis paper that I just put out last year. It's on the website if you want to look at it. It's 86 pages. I don't say it's good, again, but uh, there's stuff in there. Thank you guys for that. Um,
Um, so, are there any questions for Jason? I have some real basic questions, so please forgive me. You mentioned S uh, SEL. Can you just define yeah. that acronym? Um, it's a hot topic in education these days. It's an acronym that stands for Social Emotional Learning. So, we might have known it as EQ. Uh, and teachers are working with students these days to uh, teach them skill, SEL skills that are lumped into five categories. Uh, there's a great resource um, called CASEL, C-A-S-E-L. It's an acronym or something. Um, but they have this wheel where they, uh, a diagram where they show the first thing that you're teaching kids. Uh, and it's not so linear, but uh, the main steps are social, uh, emotional awareness first. Do I notice when I'm mad? Am I aware about why I'm mad? Um, and can I do something about that? Do I have the skills to uh, control those emotions and do something about that? The second part uh, of skills is around um, noticing, or I guess, and doing something with this. The third is social awareness, like, oh, you look mad. Uh, understanding what, what, what's happening around you with other people. And then after that uh, comes um, uh, social relationships. Like, oh, you're feeling sad, now I have the skills to know what to do about it. I can help you. Or I can change my behavior um, so it affects you positively. And all, if, apparently if you have all of those four sets of those groups of skills, then you're better able um, as a decision maker. So that's the model that a lot of public schools are using um, to help with 21st century skills in terms of interpersonal relationships. I don't know if I'm wrong on this, but I think online you can find uh, curriculum examples and that oh, yeah. you how to like, have this go into the school system. So they have everybody. There's a bunch of options. They have everybody talking about it. One is called PATS, that's also an acronym for something. <laughs> Uh, is this a follow-up? So, no, I just have another question. Yes, did somebody else have a question as well? Yeah. No, um, I was just wondering, uh, okay, the one, <laughs> well, in my year of um, doing random jobs and picking up new hobbies such as candle making and screen printing, <laughs> I was supposed to have been uh, revising and editing all of these edularps. Um, but that led to some days of feeling really confident that I could do it and people would want to read it, followed by many, many days of feeling like it's a waste of time. <laughs> we'll publish it. Well, so ideally, I would have spent the whole year doing that. But I'll, I'll read it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Great. And I, I really liked that model that you showed the presentation. Uh, I don't know if you have that, but that looks really neat. Uh, the LARP with the Yeah. Yeah. I should publish it. Yeah. Put it all together. That's your book I mean, right this is the right, this is right the right there. Try a smaller paper and get that published. It's easier, and then we'll get out there. And then be like, and now read the rest of my book. Well, if there are any um, academics who would like a uh, mentee, then maybe I would do that. Oh. Uh, so, for real? For real? Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. <laughs> so how do I get my hands on your wonder cards? Same. I, I, want, Same. A, I want a copy. How do I get a copy? I need like four or five copies. <laughs> Is it available anywhere else for sale? Or Yes. Well, well, I can send. I can find a way to send it also. But it has like few copies of you. It sounds like we should talk to you then. Uh, okay. <laughs> I would use that. Put on a trip to Brazil. Or a trip to Brazil. Oh, yeah, to Brazil. <laughs> but I can say I would use them to create edu books. Yes. Yeah. 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 And maybe, cool. let's say, yeah. I'm teaching fifth grade next year. I probably have to teach them Texas history. I don't have any Texas LARPs. <laughs> um, but creating my own cards to insert into your deck that uh, coincide with whatever content. I would, and I think that that would really be helpful in teaching teachers. Oh, you can create a LARP for your. Absolutely. Right? It's, it's, it's so all right here. You can, yes. It's a whole You don't have to come up with it. When we designed the cards, we think like, 
okay, we can like always do expansion. So yes, yeah. 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 the things. Like, okay. uh, for anybody, what's the most common barrier or just like difficulty when trying to convince or teach teachers? Or teach people to run LARPs just because it always seems very centered on like a person that is able to just manage this chaos and you know somebody comes up and come up with a rule that like stops the war from breaking out or something. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, I think it's a literacy, right? It's like that's the thing, it is a language and it, it's a collection of other intelligences, um, but it does require someone who understands it. It's not that you know, we don't have the capability. I mean, we all have the capability to draw. That's whether that was fostered within us when we were younger. And so the person is uh, like the husbandry of a garden, like the fostering of those skills. That, doing. I mean, that to me, at least, is what I Because I I've come to teachers and been like, here's this great thing to do. And they come up with all these reasons why they can't. I can't do drama. I don't feel comfortable letting my kids run around. I don't know what it's like to, I don't know what it's like to lose control. Uh, again, it's the ideas of identity, uh, self-worth, community. So th those are the things that I'm always up against. And uh, I mean, I, I've tried to, you know, this last run has been eight years, but somehow I've managed to lose my job four times doing this. Uh, it's just it was too radical and mistakes happen. I think uh, control, that's one I Teachers uh, can, can, if you want to stereotype, can be a bit controlling. Uh, and so explaining to them that you can design to have a bit more control and that, like, see what happens when you lose a tiny bit of it. Uh, so I agree with that. Also, time. Uh, it, I invest time in the preparation, my own preparation, preparing the class to play a LARP, playing the LARP, debriefing the LARP. But if I, I can convince teachers that the time is worth spending because you're going to have increased engagement and kids actually are learning things and they want to come to your class and learn. I mean, I had parents writing to my principal years ago uh, saying all of the reasons why they loved that their kids were in my second grade class and that they loved all the time to learn um, and that they, they wanted the principal to encourage the other teachers in the school to do that as well. <laughs> Uh, Anne had a third grader when she left my class and went to third grade, was weekly hounding my friend, her third grade teacher, and she needs to write some forms. Wow. So I think <laughs> um, wow. showing them that it's a, it's a worthwhile investment in time if you design well. Uh, and that um, they're like, I have to, they have this big fat task and they need to do well on it because it affects my paycheck, well in DC it does and it affects uh, my score and my assessment. Um, and so I can't spend my time playing with kids. So when I moved from second grade to fifth grade, which is a grade that is tested, uh, I taught in the exact same way as I did in a non-testing grade. And my students uh, were very close to having the top scores in DC public schools. Um, So uh, I think those are probably barriers. Maybe acting too. I think teachers think, oh, I don't know how to be an actor, and that makes me really uncomfortable. And I tell them, you're acting every day. Mm -hmm. yes. You're putting on different personas yeah. and being what your students need you to be. Uh, and you can design so we, the game master is not so important. You know? um, that question of control in looking at the two models. It seems that the Hathka stuff is a lot more control, controlling. Um, I wonder if there's kind of any cross pollination, so you can put them up against each other. Um, are there any things which can be kind of cross pollinated from one to the other? I think totally. Uh, while I was reading, I first was like, oh, maybe I'm going to be a bigger proponent of Dorothy Hathka and less of Edgebar when I started learning. <laughs> and that's why my mind was going back and forth of which one is. But I think um, I love how she goes in and out of her roles. She is the teacher, and they are they are the students, and 
and then uh, with the addition of a hat and a new accent, they know that she's this other character and they go in their roles. And just as easy as she goes into the role, they come out to reflect and discuss, well, what do you want to happen next? And I think that I would like to use that in LARPs um, to kind of plan. Oh, and when I was talking about pre-K kids, man, the legs were being perfect for them. I, in my after school job, I've been playing on the playground with four year olds. And they do just that. They're pretending as like a dragon in the night, and then they just, and I'm a dragon who really wounded, and continue to be wounded, and they go, oh, you're better. And then we're out of role, and like planning, and reflecting, and then we're right back in it. It's funny, I, just, I was at uh, Intercon, and there was a part of that did that, where you fist bump somebody, yeah, and you just go right out of game, and do a personal check in, and I thought it was going to be so immersive breaking, and it was not. Right. It was beautiful. I tried that too in the Slark for after school about superheroes. I brought my remote, remote from the TV and threw a box of blue tape on the floor. And if you wanted to stop the story at any time, you just grab the remote and pause someone. <laughs> <laughs> and then the box, I would gather and be like, you guys. And I paused them and they had to go back in the box um, and talk to me about what they should do next. <laughs> so, so I think for control, like the more game mechanics you put in there, the more control you can have to it. Teacher, but I think you're right, like Dorothy's model. You're planning out all of the steps. You know where you're going. You know at the end, the boot makers are going to have done whatever they were supposed to do, and, all, and the client is going to be happy every time. And a lot of you don't. You have no idea. There's what, no risk. Yeah. There's no risk in Dorothy's boot. But I think it's you have to be better as an improviser to do what Dorothy yeah. does. Like, you're really leading the show. Two minutes left. So another question. So uh, all your photos, it looked like they're college students who were playing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to know uh, who who's played, who do you intend it for, and what your plans are for the course. It's a very good question because when when I created it was like for college and students, but we did workshops with children, and they are really good at using the cards. Um, or our old persons, a lot a lot. Of it was really interesting because when we designed it, we focus more on the students and professionals, okay? But but the, there is a lot of people using the cards and 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 different things like like food design. I never imagined that when we create no I use the cards for food design. But there is a professor in Brazil using the cards. No, I can teach my students food design and creative food to lose the card to get food. <laughs> and, 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 and it's very, I really enjoy it because one concept, it's like a living object. So we get an object with all life. So they, they do things, they create things, the cards create things like a magical people. <laughs> so for me, it's really, really happy. But uh, I didn't imagine it. Different plays in different ways. I was usually inspired by tarot cards, like ways of play. Nice. So uh, we, we, we create like three basic, three basic ways of play, but we encourage and simulate, so create our own ways with the cards and combine the cards. It's, it's like an open design. It reminds me of a thing from the future. Yes, yes, it was inspired by you, sort of kind of. We kind of officially run out of time, but one last question. Okay, um, I was getting daunted when I'm trying to connect like a discrete, um, discrete lesson with analogous material. So I was wondering, outside of just like discrete um, methods that you found for constructing media and preparation or mid play. Or like long term uh, Yeah. Um, I think the the debrief specifically can look really in many different ways. And I mix uh, some debriefs you probably experience in large C play with teachery things. Like uh, out of Harvard, there's some work called Project Zero. Uh, they've created what they call thinking routines with like brain scientist people. Um, 
summarized, what are, how do we make learning visible? Um, how do we pull out learning from experiences? And there are really simple protocols for pulling out learning. So I rely on those a bunch. Um, one's called Circle of Viewpoints, and I use that um, uh, to learn about different people's point of view during the progressive era. And I think I just keep coming back to the LARP, like I said, like it is a text that we read, like it is a textbook, like it is a film that we watched, like it's a current event news article that we read. We read those too, but that it's all it's as important um, as that text. I mean, if the LARP is written well. Um, and so we keep talking about it, and we do have some artifacts around the room. Kids also, I think because they're playing a character, I have kids who are now taught kids in second grade who are now in fifth grade and they remember certain LARPs and they remember the characters that they play. Um, so it's like LARPs you've played and they stick with you um, if it's designed well. I also find like campaign type LARPs sometimes work better because you're revisiting the characters and different things happen in the story. So in second grade we carried a town called Spelling because we're worried about the community with responsibility for citizens, like little kids. Played for two or three months, um, and so since they were so immersed in this story, when I just taught some content of here are the three branches of government and here's how they operate, then we we actually made them. Uh, so I think the play is also sometimes like pulling out the the learning. In fifth grade, I had them do a lot of academic reading and discussion played sometimes, so you really had to know what was happening in that time period of different points and conflicts in order to play um, an interesting story. I don't know if that might be to do But I can show you a collection of LARPs. You have a response Yeah. I remember I was just, like doing uh, the giving tree. It's like, how did the leaf feel? Yeah. How did the leaf feel? Okay, no, no, no. Instant tears. It's not a child's book. 